So first of all, I mean, I know quite a few ones to start a TAVI program in India. And the patient who you should look for is patient with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are at high surgical risk. These are the patients who today are candidate for TAVI in India, not patient with aortic regurgitation. It's patient with aortic stenosis. And when you assess these patients, you should also make sure that the treatment is not going to be futrine. Some of these patients will be quite old, quite frail, and will not benefit from the procedure. So you also have to do this kind of assessment when you select your patients for a TAVI procedure. And I will recommend you when you start, select good candidates. I'm going to give you some example here, what is a good candidate and what is not a good candidate. If you start to take everyone on board, you're going to have disasters, which may stop your program before it even gets started here. So it should be a patient who have good LV function, good lung function, good renal function, also is a good candidate, as I showed before, and also have a good anatomy for a TAVI procedure. I'm just going to give you some example here. TAVI, all the evidence for TAVI against surgery is based on patient who got a tricuspid aortic valve. It's not the same as we do not treat patients with bicuspid aortic valve, but it's often related with more inferior outcome, more parvalvar leak, more valve embolization, and so on. So the good candidates are patients with tricuspid aortic valves. So start with those patients and not patients with bicuspid aortic valves. We saw this morning, those of you who followed the case, we saw a patient who had severe calcification in the ST junction. More common you see patients have severe calcification at the annulus level, extending down to the left ventricular alpha tract. And once again, these patients, when you use balloon for pre-dilatation or post-dilatation, or you use a balloon expandable valve, are at high risk for an annulus rupture. You just saw one example a minute ago here. So also keep this in mind. These are also patients where you have a much higher risk of a suboptimal outcome. And then there's an issue about coronary arteries. Uh, we today rarely see coronary obstructions of, for, with TAVI, but that's because we look very carefully for it. And you can see here again on the left-hand side, you have one who have a high takeoff of the coronary arteries, and on the right-hand side, one who have a very low. And there will be a high risk here with the low takeoff, where then you put the valve in, that the native evis is going to be pushed aside and may potentially occlude for the left main stem. And then also you need to bring the valve in. Uh, this is on the, again on the right hand side. The left hand side you see a smooth aortic arch. You will also see patients who have a quite acute angulation of this aortic arch. And I'm sure you can all imagine what's going to happen and what is the risk if you try to advance a TAVI delivery system across uh, uh, aortic arch looking like this. There will be a, a chance or risk that you have a perforation or a dissection in this arch. And then again, most importantly because we know that during the history of TAVI, the most common complication and the complication who most often lead to a fatal outcome is vascular complication. So look at the closely on a CT scan on the vascular axis. You see here again on the left-hand side, nice axis, large size vessel, not particularly tortuous, no calcium, low bifurcation. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, you see a patient who has severe calcification and there will be a risk of vascular complication. It's been better today because the, the, we now have smaller systems. Uh, we have expandable sheet which can address patients with even smaller anatomy. This is uh, the case you saw this morning was done with this hydroval from India here with a delivery system. It's a Fortune France comparable system. So you can treat patients with a diameter down to five millimeter in the iliac femoral artery. And then also if you want to have a safe vascular complication, you need to have a good access to start with. And remember, you want to puncture the common femoral artery about two, one to two centimeters above the bifurcation. Why does it need to be above the bifurcation? Again, it is if you're going to have a vascular complication and you cannot solve it with a balloon inflation, but you need to put a cover stand in, you need to have a distance from the bifurcation. Otherwise, you're going to occlude one of the vessels when you put a cover stand in. So that's very important to keep in mind. This is the place to puncture it. And you can get this information on your pre-procedural CT scan. Where's the bifurcation? What is the size of the vessel at this point? Is there any calcification at this spot? 
And then there's two ways to do it. We all started out, in this case, this morning was also do done with it. You go in from the contralateral side, you do a crossover, you can do an injection, and you can identify both where is the bifurcation and where is the proper site to puncture. And during small injection, you can actually, with your needle, guide it in the middle of the vessel, exactly at the point where you want to be. There's been a move uh, in most countries now to go away from this because it both gives radiation, uh, at least to the operator, and also contrast to the patient. So it seems to be much more efficient and safe to use ultrasound guidance. So again, even use your ultrasound guidance, you can exactly determine what is your distance to the bifurcation. You can see that the needle is puncturing the vessel in the central part of it and a place where you have no calcium. And again, this is the first important start if you want to have a safe tr access to uh, transfemoral access. Most sites will use uh, proglide or what is called in Europe and US now the prostyle, but it's the same concept. You put one and often two in. It's a suture going into the wall. It will, you put it in at the beginning, you leave the suture, and then you tighten the suture up at the end of the procedure. If you do not have access to this or you do not have experience to it, and your surgeons want to do a cut down, it's also possible to do a cut down and find the place where you want to put it in and the surgeons can close after you. And also it's important up front to be ready for a bailout scenario. In our institution, we know exactly what size balloon we need and what size copper stent we need if you have a failure afterwards. It is in the room, it's next to the patient, so we can easily open it. And you can see this is one example here of a patient who had, uh, after closure, a severe leak. You can go in with a balloon to start with and inflate that for a couple of minutes. If that doesn't help, have a copper stent, that's going to save your day, if you see here. And it's a safe to use copper stent in these uh, arteries. It's not going to cause any migration or any fracture down the line. So again, I said, vascular complication is the main, uh, have been the major complication during the entire procedure causing most mortality. But there's also other complications. And we know from the beginning that TAVI has been related with a higher rate of new onset conduction abnormality and need for permanent pacemaker. And the reason is that, as you just heard, you have the aortic cusp here, and below the right and the non, you have the membranous septum, and just below the membranous septum, you have the conduction system. So the lower you're going to implant your valve, the higher is the risk that you're going to interfere with the conduction system, and the patient will have a new left bundle band block, or even a complete uh, heart block with the need for a permanent pacemaker. So everyone wants to implant in a higher position, of course, without risking to have a pop out. When TAVI started, most sites used the C-arm in an, what we call a three cusp co plan of view. It means that the C-arm was positioned in an LAO cranial projection. The problem with this projection is that despite you have the three orthic cusp aligned with the imaging plane, was that you have a parallax in your delivery system. So you do not have a one-to-one -one understanding how deep or how high were your implant. So that has shifted now. And what you saw this morning was we use what people are calling the cusp ball of view. It means that from the pre-procedural CT scan, you identify the C-arm angulation where the right and the left cusps are overlapping. And in this view, you're going to have no parallax in the delivery system, and you still have the three aortic cusp line. And it's been demonstrated with all valve platform, that's going to bring your pacemaker rate down this is just a study we did uh, back in Copenhagen using those two different C-arm projections. And despite we're aiming for the same implantation that it caused a 50% reduction in the need for new permanent pacemaker. So permanent pacemaker is still higher with TAVI than it is after surgical or valve replacement, but it's much closer nowadays than it used to be where some of the valves were running with a pacemaker rate between 20 and 30%. Parvalda leak has also been an issue, uh, and um, there's several ways to assess for paravalvular leak. After valve deployment, you can do an aortic root injection, look for how much contrast is leaking back to the LV. You can do echocardiography, as you also saw this morning, or you can look at the hemodynamics before and after. And a combination of these three modalities is probably the best assessment you can have of paravalvular leak. So what you can do, again here, after valve deployment, put the pigtail down, do an injection, try to have a look how much contrast is actually leaking back to the LV. 
Of course, it's depending on how deep, how high is your pigtail, how much volume are you giving, and also what is the stroke volume for the patient. The second way to do it is to do an echocardiography. Often the best assessment is in a short axis. You can try to look how much is the leak around the perimeter of the stent frame. Less than 10% is called mild, more than 30% is called severe. And the final way you can do it is to look at the hemodynamic. Do the hemodynamic measurements before impl valve implantation and afterwards. Don't look as much at what is the gradient because we know the patient has severe aortic stenosis. Look what is the diastolic pressure in the aorta and what is the end diastolic pressure in the LV. Compare what's before and after, and that's also going to give you some information how much PVL do you have. If you have a significant uh, parvalve leak, that can be different reason. You can have implanted the valve too deep, so the sealing skirt is not sealing off. The valve cannot be fully expanded, it can be constrained, or maybe you have chosen a valve which was too small for the patient. If you have a too deep implantation, as you can see here, the valve is sitting very deep, the ceiling skirt is not doing its job. One way to do it is to add to implant a new valve, or you can go in with self-expanding technology, put a snare on it, and you can gently pull it up in a correct position. If you have a valve which is not fully expanded because you have severe calcification, like in this case, the way to go is, of course, to take a balloon, do a post-dilatation, a gentle post-dilatation, respect the anatomy, the calcium burden, and that's going to expand the valve and often going to mit uh, mitigate uh, the, uh, the amount of par valve leak. And then finally, if you have a valve which is too small because you didn't do your job properly, again, you can snare it. You need to pull it out of the, SV, uh, the sinus of a salva into the ascending aorta. Keep that tension on the snare when you take a larger valve, going across that valve, and deploy it. So these are the three way to assess for par valve leak, the three causes for par valve leak, and the three way to treat a par valve leak. Last thing is that, and we also discussed this morning, that you put a too small valve into the patient. If the patient will have patient prosthesis mismatch, so the patient have a too small effective orifice area, we know that this patient is prone to have early valve failure. And you can see here, that meta to show that self-expanding technology is going to give you better hemodynamic performance than bi uh, balloon expandable valve and surgical valves, and surgical valves are going to give you better hemodynamic performance than balloon expandable valves. So particularly if you have patients with small aortic annulus who are at high risk for patient procedure mismatch, consider to use a self-expanding technology. I'm just going to show you here uh, a slide once again of the valve we used this morning. It's a valve from India, self-expanding technology try to combine all the features of oil valves. It got super in a leaflet position, offer the best hemodynamic performance, lowest rate of par valve leak, large stent cells, so it's easy to access the coronary arteries. It's a very flexible system, will take very tortuous anatomy. And also you can see the inflow portion is quite cylindric, it's not tapered, so you have less interference with the conduction system. And this was a genesis trial which actually led to approval in India. And you can see it have one digit gradient, very large opening area, 2.3 per square centimeter, low rate of pacemaker, 7.5% at 30 days, and also very low rate of more than mild PVL, 2.9%. So it's certainly offering you a state of the art. And just going back here to my last slide, what is the patient prestige mismatch? For again, for the self-expanding technology compared to the balloon expandable valves, in patient particularly at risk, patient with small aortic analy defined as 23 millimeter less. If you choose a balloon expandable valve, it's going to be about 25% of the patient who have severe PPM. If you choose a self-expanding technology, it's going to be only 3%. Thank you.